you've been hurting deep down inside let me encourage you it's gonna be all right troubles and trials kind to make you strong keep on believing you keep holding on so get ready get ready for your blessing your blessing get ready Good morning. As you can see, I have a mask on this morning and I'm encouraging you to wear one as well. I wanna welcome you to the worship service of the New England Baptist Church I'm in the sanctuary. Uh, <clears throat> it's not necessary to wear the mask because I'm alone, but we are encouraged to wear a mask at all times because the pandemic is not relenting. Let us be particularly careful uh, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, as we celebrate our family gatherings, that we stay well and healthy. And we praise God for how, how well and healthy we are and how the pandemic has seemed to pass over us. Reminds me of the Passover blood on the lamppost. So I thank God for how he has extended his blessings to us. We do have one member that we are praying about and ask you to continue to pray about. That's our Deacon Wim Taylor. Uh, who was hospitalized over a few days. And I just got a text from his wife a few minutes ago who informed me that he'll be coming home today. So we continue to pray for him and others, uh, but we also want to be uh, mindful that, you know, he is going to be in recovery and we can find ways to contact him and encourage him without calling him to the telephone. So thank you all for that. It's a great week of celebration. Uh, we had the food ministry. I think it was 1,200 boxes of food were distributed across the community. We thank God for the opportunity to do that. We thank God for the leadership of the uh, men's ministry, in particular the diaconate, to help us extend those blessings to the community. And the good news is we're gonna do it again next month. Uh, I think the date is December 12th. Uh, weather doesn't matter because when you're hungry, you know, uh, we're gonna help people who, you know, they have food needs, they have Christmas stuff and all of that. So. Thank God we'll be able to continue this blessing through the month of uh, December. So keep that in mind. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a, uh, the missionaries led a, a collection yesterday for women's items for the new um, shelter that's being provided in our county for uh, women who are in distress because of domestic and other situations. So very grateful uh, for all who contributed to that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-day deal. You know who the missionaries are, 
If you have some items that they can use, make sure you touch base with them. I was down in, uh, I was down in, in uh, another area of, uh, I was at the river yesterday afternoon and I went to Walmart down there uh, to get some stuff and they had a whole basket full of book packs and it said $1 each. So I got a bunch of them. You know, when you see deals and you think about things that people can use, get them, share them, bless other people. Let us continue to be mindful of that. The third thing we want to be careful, I mean, be mindful of is, as we in, enter into the holiday season and opportunities to be a blessing is Christmas mother. Uh, we've participated in that idea uh, here in the county for a couple of years now. Uh, the process has started. Sister Kalisha Crump is leading that effort. Uh, please contact her and make sure that we participate to help, again, children, families that uh, might want to celebrate, have a, a, merry, a very Merry Christmas, and despite what their situations are. I was delighted last week uh, to have a Sunday off, if you will, but I still listened to the service, participated in the service, and grateful to uh, Reverend Larry Cherry, who brought the message last week, and I was even more happy to get back a note from him, which said, your church is a wonderful church. Let me know when you're doing other things. It says two things to me. One is people see us as being good people, as being good ambassadors for Christ. And secondly, it says when we're doing ministry, when we're out helping people, other people want to come along. So praise God for it. Thank you all for what you're doing, for what we're doing together, lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And so we come together now in worship of Jesus Christ and begin our service with um, the scripture and prayer from the chairman of our deacon board, Deacon Robert Wright. If you will, Deacon Wright, give us a scripture and invocation for the morning. Good morning. Our scripture this morning will be coming from Psalm 67, and I'll be reading from verses 1 through 7. And it reads, starting at verses 1, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the people praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing upon his word this morning. And now let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come again this morning, this Sunday morning, Father, we call the place of worship, the hour of worship. Lord, we come with our hearts and our minds turned toward you, Father. We take this time out to worship you this morning, to give you honor and to give you praise. For we know that you are a just, a true, but also, Father, a living God. And so we come to thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all the days that you have given us, Master. Father, we thank you for making a pathway for us, Father, that we may gain wisdom through your word, but also, Father, we see righteousness in you. Lord, we thank you for this church, New Elam. We thank you for this praise hour that we're about to enter into. And Lord, we ask that you will bless each and every one of your stewards that are here today. Yes. Oh Lord, we ask that you will bless the pastor of this church. Give him the wisdom, give him the courage, Father, to speak truth to power. And as we go into our worship hour this morning, Master, we pray for all the saints and all those who wish to join in with us, Father, but not the ability or maybe the, the ways of being able to be connected. But Father, we ask that each and every one of us will be mindful of someone who do not know you in the pardon of their sin. Mm -hmm. Oh dear Lord, we ask and we pray that what is be, about to be said today, that it will touch each and every one of our hearts in a new way. Yes. And that we will be here on your kingdom, 
out reaching out to your people, Father, asking them to come to your house of sanctuary. We pray these things this morning, Father, through your son, Jesus Christ. In his name's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon. Love the Old Testament Psalms. And, uh, you know, quite often we focus much of our uh, study, much of our sermon preparation, much of our sermons on New Testament. But today we are going to be in an Old Testament scripture. So I'm going to give you all a head start. It's in Nehemiah. Nehemiah may not be one that you go to every week or every month or every year, but give you a little head start. It's in the Old Testament, not that hard to find. But uh, to the setting, uh, the, the song that we're about to hear kind of sets the tone for what the sermon is going to be today. So I'd like to hear our first song from our choir previously recorded.
Thank you, choir. We're always happy to hear our choir. And we look forward to that time when we will be together in the sanctuary, hearing from the choir again. And again, we thank you, Kalisha, for leading that song and a reminder that she's our Christmas mother and leading our effort uh, toward helping out those who need assistance during the holiday season. God bless you all. Thank you for your service. Uh, we've come to that point in our service where we have an opportunity to, to pray for those who are sick. I've mentioned Deacon Taylor. Uh, we also want to hold up the son, Gerard Taylor. I want to hold up the, the whole Taylor family, his wife, his children, his sister, uh, everybody, because it's just a tough time uh, with all that's going on to be sick. But praise God, uh, we got the announcement, or I got the the text that he's coming home today. So we're happy about that. There may be others um, that are sick that I haven't had the opportunity to know about, but we wanna lift those up. Uh, we wanna give praises for the work that's being done here through our church, at our church. Uh, we're grateful for all those who have participated in that. And we're grateful for those who are giving. Um, we had Men's Day in November and we asked the men to give $100. And I think I saw the collection that said one person gave $100. And I'm grateful to that person because it was me. I know I did, and I hope that you will. And I know the times are tough. We're paying taxes. We got Thanksgiving. We got Christmas. But we want to ask you to do a sacrificial giving of $100, Ben. And we want to ask the women who love men, love their men, love a man, Give $100 in memory of somebody or thankful for somebody so that we can end the year on a very positive note financially. Uh, we're, we're above ground, but <clears throat> that's largely because our expenses have been cut. So just because we're not meeting don't mean y'all are supposed to stop giving. Just because we're not in here doesn't mean that the function of the church is not going on. So I ask you to consider what you have been doing uh, and ask you to do more. And, and we so that we can end this year. We just had a church business meeting. And, he, and here's one of the reasons why. Nobody saw COVID coming. So we had to adjust some things in the way we do things in order to continue meeting. Those things cost money. In order to do Zoom, it costs money. In order to do the, the infrastructure parts of it, it costs money. And it's gonna cost more as we go along. And so we need to budget for that. We need to plan for that. We need to give for that. So keep in mind all the things that we're doing, all the plans that we have, because our church is alive and well. And, and again, when you're, uh, when you're out front, you gotta stay out in front. So I ask you now to consider carefully how you're giving and I thank you in advance. Uh, for how you are going to give and for what you have given. So I asked Deacon uh, Crawford to, uh, I think, yeah, Deacon Crawford, you're going to lead the prayer this morning for our sick, for praise, and for a thanks to God for what has been given and what we anticipate will be given going forward. Our prayer for the morning will be led by our Deacon Crawford, Melvin Crawford. Good morning, everybody. God is certainly good. And what a pleasure and an honor it is to be able to go to him in prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you this morning, Father. Once again, you have set aside another day, dear Lord. And we give you all the honor and we give you all the praise, Father. But first things first, Father, we ask that you will kindly forgive us of our wrong thinking, sometimes our wrong doing, dear God. But we know that you are a loving and forgiving God, and the enemy has no place in our lives. And we thank you, God, for allowing us to be here. Dear God, we ask that you will continue to watch over and bless those who gave, dear Father, simply for the cause the uplifting of your church family. Father, we also, dear God, we ask that you would rain down upon the Taylor family, dear God. Send them a healing from heaven, dear God. Stop by each and every member, dear God, also in this family. Touch them, dear God. 
And we ask them to, I mean, we pray that you will allow them to be able to call on the name of Jesus whenever they need love, peace, and joy. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will bless the pastor and the message that is coming forth, dear Lord. Dear God, plant it deep in our hearts and our soul, dear Father. So we may go out and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. Father, we also, dear God, we just want to thank all the leaders, dear God, and all the ministries, dear God, that you had touched. We ask that you continue to bless them in a mighty way, dear God. So we may take care of your people, Father, and bless another. And dear God, we are so excited to be able to do that. Not only excited, dear God, we realize it is an opportunity to give you praise, to give you glory, to lift up your name, Jesus. And we thank you for that opportunity. Father, we bless this Sunday, dear God. Bless everybody from the hearing of my voice, dear Father. In Jesus' name, the wonderful blessed name of our Savior, amen. And amen. <clears throat> thank you, Deacon Crawford. Uh, thank you. you. Heard your prayer, and we are all encouraged by having heard you offer that on our benefit. And certainly, we all have the opportunity to to lift our own voices to God with our concerns. And He hears us. He cares. He loves us. And so, as I mentioned, <clears throat> um, I hope y'all have had a chance to find Nehemiah yet. We're going to be in the fourth chapter of Nehemiah, I want you to be along with me as, uh, as I read this text. But before that, Nehemiah has uh, an encouragement for us. He has an encouragement for us. There's a great encouragement in this, in this text that we're gonna to hear today in this story. And so the next song also encourages us, uh, victory is mine, victory is mine. We'll hear from our choir again, and then we'll hear our message for the morning.
wonderful song of encouragement. And again, thank you, choir. And again, thank you, Ecclesia, for, uh, for leading us. I want to ask you to turn, if you will, to the fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. <clears throat> Beginning at verse 4 and going through verse, verse 14, and I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Amorites, and the, and, and the men of Ashad heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard night and day to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemy stand said, before we know it or see us, they will be right there among them and will kill them and put it into the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us 10 times over, whatever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest point of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, their, their, their bow, bows, excuse me. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing. Father God, we ask that you would empower these words for your people as we struggle daily and daily against things that would have us to feel less than, to feel oppressed, to feel despised, to feel lonely. Give us a word of encouragement as Nehemiah did to the people. Bless these words in Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah 4, six through 14, I, I titled this as a question. Feel like giving up? Finally, 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 finally is Thanksgiving. A time for good news. Traditionally, it's that holiday that, that forces us to stop briefly and consciously and to be grateful. To be grateful for our lives, to be grateful for our families, to be grateful for our God and for what he's done for us. Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving is a ray of sunshine on a cloudy day. The opportunity to change gears and enjoy the company of family and friends who have crossed miles to be together. Well, that is for most years, but this is 2020. 2020 has changed everything for everybody. And I'm afraid even Thanksgiving may not lift our spirits this year. As with everything else this year, Thanksgiving won't be the same. Despite our hopes and our plans for a joyous time together, enjoying this special holiday with many of our friends and family, a lot of us are not gonna be able to do it the same. We're not gonna be able to do it this year, the same as last year and the same as every year before. You see, every once in a while, Every once in a while in life, we all reach a point where we, we're just ready to get, throw in the towel. Throw in the towel and give up. We're tired, we're frustrated, we're exhausted. And we feel like there's no use continuing to try. 
whether it's a job, whether it's a relationship, it could be a health issue, it could be something school, it could be trying to lose weight, your wedding plans are scrapped, your vacations delayed or postponed, or you've just given up on it altogether. Even Thanksgiving gatherings, as an example. We sometimes just don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And, and we'd rather just quit the fight. We have become unsure and afraid of the future. I don't know. Have you been there before? Are you one of those people who's fearing the future even now? Well, many years ago, there was a man in Kentucky who had recently retired from the Postal Service. He'd been sitting on his front porch when his first Social Security check arrived, and he, he looked at it and he felt so frustrated. He said to himself, I've been working all these years, and is this all I have to look forward to for the rest of my life? He'd put in a long and a hard career, and now he has little to show for it compared to what he had. He's asking himself, was it really worth all that hard work? So he sat down and he made a list of all his blessings. Rather than complain, he thought about his blessings. And he thought about the good things he had going for him. And on that list of things, those blessings, he included his mother's famous recipe for fried chicken which included 11 different herbs and spices. And he was the only one that his mother had given that recipe. He was the holder of it. So he went to a nearby restaurant and asked if he could cook some chicken. And they said, yeah. And pretty soon this became the most popular item at the restaurant. So he went and opened his own restaurant and he called it Kentucky Fried Chicken and the rest is history. Harlan Sanders was tired Harlan Sanders was frustrated, but he refused to give up. But, but, but Harlan Sanders kept a positive attitude. He counted his blessings. He saw an opportunity and he moved on it. What was the cause of this lack of hope? This frustration with life, the disappointment of dreams and plans deferred that is running rampant across our land, even across our world. Well, there's a certain health problem that's it's running its course through our land. It's one of the worst and largest and greatest illnesses of all time. It's a universal disease and it's highly contagious. And I tell you what, if you're around somebody who has it, you're gonna catch it fairly quickly. Oh, some people are calling it new, but it's actually been around a long time. It's called the disease of discouragement. Discouragement has been defined as the feelings of despair in the face of obstacles. It's when you're just tired of going forth and putting forth the effort and you're ready to call it quits. Somebody used to say, and you just feel like you toe up from the flow up. And we've all been there, haven't we? We may even be there now, ready to give up on whatever we've been battling because we've been battling so long. But as always, the Bible gives us answers to life's problems. And this reading in the book of Nehemiah is a great story about both the causes and the cures for this disease of discouragement. You see, many years earlier in the history of Israel, the walls of Jerusalem had been destroyed. And the people were now defenseless and vulnerable to their enemies. Nehemiah was in the king's household. He was the cupbearer for the king. But Nehemiah was called by God to lead the people in rebuilding the walls. But it seemed like an impossible task and the, and the morale of the people was low. They were very discouraged. They couldn't see any light at the end of any tunnel. But let's look at the story and discover what the causes were of their discouragement. <clears throat> the first cause of feeling like giving up is fatigue. If you look at verse 10, it says the strength of the laborers is giving up. There was a man in my community, his name was Mr. Dan. Mr. Dan was the well digger in our community. And I'd often stop by to watch him work. And I used to hear Mr. Dan at the end of a day, after digging wells, he said, I'm just give out. And I don't know, have you ever felt give out? These people had worked hard, they'd worked long and hard and they were now just totally disgusted. 
And when you're physically tired and worn down, it's almost impossible to be emotionally and spiritually up. So what's the best thing to do when you're tired, when you're fatigued? Get your rest. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just go to bed and get some rest, get some sleep. There was a famous football coach called Vince Lombardi. That was his name. And he said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And, and isn't it amazing how much better things seem to be after a good night's sleep? Fatigue can often lead to discouragement, so it is vitally important that we get the proper amount of rest. Fatigue and discouragement usually occur when you're halfway through whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, as it says in verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. You know, whenever you start a project, everybody's excited. Everybody's got energy at the beginning of the new task. But it always seems that about halfway through it, we're beginning to wonder if we're ever going to make it to the end. When you start out on the midpoint of climbing a mountain, you see how far you've come, how far you've got to go. You get tired. You start wondering, hmm, should I even try to continue? And that's why so many people never finish what they start because they get halfway there, they get worn out, and they give up. Are you worn out? Are you discouraged? Then get the rest you need. That's gonna help you solve the problem. The second cause of feeling like giving up is frustration. In verse 10, it says, there's so much rubble in trying to rebuild the wall, they discovered there was litter and debris and trash lying in the way. Broken bricks and mortar were getting in their way and they were getting frustrated. I don't know if you've ever been involved in a remodeling project in a home or any kind of building. Have you ever been working on any kind of project and stuff is in the way? You know the frustration of the rubble that lies in the way. You see it at home right now. Whether your home has suddenly became your office, whether your home has suddenly became a schoolhouse, there's more stuff around than there ever was. And it just seems like rubble never goes away. It's always in the way. You accomplish one task and then there's another one to be done. And before long, it starts to make you irritable. Before long, you're feeling frustrated. You can't avoid the rubble, but you've got to be able to recognize it and know what to do with it or you're never going to reach your goal. Rubble. Rubble is anything in your life that keeps you from accomplishing your goals. You made New Year's resolutions, but you found that rubble got in the way. COVID came along. New Year's resolution was to lose weight. Now you're isolated in the house, full of food. Perhaps your goal was to read the Bible more often, but you, you find there's just too much noise in the house. You can't find a quiet place. You can't concentrate. Now that you're working from home, teaching from home, being at home, you see rubble in places that you never noticed before. <clears throat> Excuse me. But you've got to be able to recognize the rubble and you've got to recognize what you can do about it. What is it that distracts you? What is it that eats away at your productive time? Well, that's what's rubble. That's what's called rubble. And then it's going to frustrate you and discourage you until you do something about it. And the third cause of feeling like giving up is failure. Again, verse 10, it says, we cannot rebuild the wall. They didn't meet their deadline in finishing the wall, so they got discouraged. They were ready to give up because they had failed to meet their deadline. Their confidence is short. They lose heart. They lose their enthusiasm. They give up because they have failed to accomplish their goal. Failure is a major cause of being discouraged. Just about the time I think I'm going to make ends meet, somebody comes along and moves the end, is a famous old quotation. So the question is, how do you respond to failure? How do you respond when you don't accomplish your goals on time? Do you blame yourself? Do you blame someone else? People who have learned to win in life have learned how to get back on a horse after the horse bucks them off. Somebody once said, courage is being scared to death, but getting back up on the horse, saddling back up anyway. Successful people see failures not as an end, but as a temporary setback. The death of Jesus Christ on that cross was not a failure. It was merely a three-day setback. 
Never give up when you have failed. We have more than conquerors through him that loved us. The fourth cause of feeling like giving up is fear. And in verse 11, it says, also our enemy said, before they know or to see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put it into the work. Their enemy was doing everything they could to see that the wall wouldn't be rebuilt. They ridiculed them, they criticized them, and finally they threatened them. And the Jewish people were discouraged because of their fear of being hurt or even of being killed or losing their lives. In verse 12, it says, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Fear certainly causes us to be discouraged. So we have to address our fears. What are your fears today? Is it a fear of failure? Is it a fear of rejection? Is it a fear about your health concerns? Is it a fear of being criticized? Fear will certainly cause feelings of discouragement in our lives. But when your discouragement over fear in your life tries to overwhelm you, when fear comes into your life, and tries to overwhelm you, the only thing you seem to want to do is just pack up your bags and leave. But the bad thing is when you leave, fear and discouragement are never far behind you. You can run from fear, but you can't hide. So in this story, we see four things that can cause us to feel discouraged, fatigue, frustration, failure, fear. And if you're feeling discouraged today, you can be sure that one of these four things is central to the cause of it. It's in there somewhere. In this story, we have seen the causes of discouragement, but now let's look at a moment for some cures for discouragement. First of all, rest your body. When you read this whole chapter, Nehemiah actually gives his people some holidays. He gives them some time off to get the proper rest that they need. And as I've already mentioned, one of the simplest and best things you can do to help with discouragement is to get away and get some rest. It's not a sin to get rest. It's not laziness to get rest. Jesus often went away by himself and got the rest he needed. In our busy schedules, we make the excuse that I just don't have the time to rest. Well, let me tell you something, friends. If you can't make time to rest now, you're going to find some rest in the hospital later on. Psalm 127, 2 says, In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. He grants sleep to those he loves. God created your body to work, but he also created it to get the rest it needs in order to do the work that is required. He has commanded us to Sabbath. It is important that God made it one of the Ten Commandments saying that for the, every seventh day, we need to set it aside for rest. Secondly, reorganize your life. <clears throat> Verse 13 says, therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points at the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, their bows. Nehemiah didn't give up on the goal. He just reorganized the people and put them in the right places. When you are discouraged, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing the wrong things. It just may mean that you're doing the right thing, but in the wrong way. God isn't asking you to give up on your dreams. He's just saying go after them in a different way. Go after them his way. So that means we have to reorganize and do it in a different way. If you're in debt, reorganize and do some things differently. If you're waiting to gain some weight, reorganize your eating patterns. If you're overcommitted, recognizing you've got to have time to yourself. To beat discouragement doesn't mean that you have to give up and quit. Simply reorganize, do things differently. And notice that Nehemiah grouped them by families, the text says. And that's why we need each other. That's why we need each other in our homes. And that's why we need to stay connected as a church. Throughout the Bible, we hear this phrase over and over again, one another, one another. God knows that we need each other to keep from getting discouraged. We're told to love one another, encourage one another, serve one another. Pray for one another, 
We need the support of our families at home and, and in this church in order to keep from being discouraged. And if you're feeling discouraged today, reorganize, make some changes, find support in your family, in your home, and at your church. Stay connected to the church. Thirdly, remember the Lord, it says in verse 14. And I love this and it keeps coming back to me. Don't be afraid. This is a tremendous time of fear in our lives, in our country, but God keeps telling us, do not fear. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. When feeling discouraged and worn out, you've got to get reconnected and recharged with God. And you do that also by Sabbath. Yesterday, I plugged up my Fitbit because it had run kind of low. And, and when I went to put it on and I was leaving, uh, I was a little bit surprised that the battery was in worse shape than when I plugged it in. Well, I figured out the reason. The reason the battery had run down even lower than when I plugged it in is that I had to plug the charger into the wall. It wasn't connected to the source. So when you're feeling discouraged, you've got to get connected to the source if you want the power. Typically, when we feel discouraged, we, we've got our eyes on the problem and not on the Lord. We're not looking at what the problem is. We're not looking at the place we need to be connected. We need to remember our source for living in times of discouragement is Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, and get reconnected. Remember God's faithfulness to you in the past. Remember how close God is to you now in the present. Remember his power for you in the future. The promises are throughout the Bible. When you feel discouraged, get your mind off the problem and put your mind on the Lord. Remember who he is. Remember all he's done for you. The best way to do this is to make time to spend time with his word. David tells us in Psalm 119, 25, I was laid low in the dust, preserving my life according to your word. Over and over again throughout the Bible, God tells us, be encouraged. Do not be afraid. He assures us his presence and his faithfulness is there in all our discouraging times. But you're never going to know it unless you read it for yourself. Remember the Lord. Get reconnected by studying his word. That's the power source that you need to get your Fitbit connected and charged up and ready to go. And that's what you need to get your life, your heart, your mind ready to go. Get connected to the power source. Fourth, resist discouragement. In verse 14, Nehemiah says to fight for your family and home. Don't give up. Don't roll over. Don't pay dead. Get in the battle. Fight for what's important to you. Resist discouragement. D.L. Moody, a famous theologian, says, I've never known God to use a discouraged person. I've never known God to use a discouraged person. You see, keeping us discouraged, see, keeping us discouraged is one of Satan's biggest weapons against us. The Bible reminds us that we're not fighting against those things that are physical. What we're fighting is physical battle, I mean, spiritual battles. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting spiritual forces. Satan knows that if you and I are discouraged, he's won the battle because we won't feel like doing anything for God or doing anything godly in our lives. So we've got to make the choice to resist discouragement. We've got to make the choice to resist the devil and his schemes and continue to fight spiritually and emotionally. And discouragement is always a choice. It's not a feeling. You choose to stay on the ground. You choose to get back on the horse. But if you know that you're on the ground, Satan is satisfied. If you don't get back up, even though you've been bucked off, Satan is satisfied. Resist the discouragement in your life. Fight for your families. Fight for your homes. When we finish this meeting today, I want you to stop. Stop and get unbusy. Stop, get unbusy, 
and talk with the Lord and determine what it is that's causing this discouragement in your life. Is it fatigue? Is it frustration? Is it failure? Is it fear? And, and once you have discovered it, you've got to do something about it. Rest, reorganize, remember, reconnect with God. Resist it, reload, keep fighting the battle, but never, ever, never give up. Perhaps the most important thing you can do when you feel discouraged is simply to pray. David felt discouraged through the Psalms and he told God how he felt. God calls us into personal relationship with him. We are not connected to God through other people. And because we are connected with God on a personal level, because we have a relationship with him, and I pray you do, then you can tell God how you feel. So my question, what's the last time you told God how you felt? But I tell you this, he's waiting to hear from you. He doesn't care about you being mad. He doesn't care about you being depressed. He doesn't care about your frustration or your worry. He wants to hear from you. Don't let those things interrupt your time with God. Put all your eggs in one basket and take that basket to God. Are you discouraged today? Do you feel like giving up? Well, remember the lessons of Nehemiah. And it also might be helpful to remember the words of the writer of Romans 8, 28, when he says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to his purpose for them. One of the great fears you face in life is a fear of the future. This whole epidemic, this whole pandemic, this whole election season causes great amounts of fear. We're fearing about the future. We're fearing about our family. We're worrying about our friends. We're worrying about our job. There is fear about our community. There is fear about a whole range of things. And it's natural to have this. It's natural to have this for one reason, because you're not in control. But the fact that you realize you're not in control, that realization should cause you to trust God more deeply because he is in control. You might not be in control of your future, but God is. God created the entire universe. And, and if he wanted to, he could just snap it out of existence in a moment. If he wanted to, he could stop the pandemic or anything else is troubling us. And, and yet he is working his plan and history and he is working through us. He's moving history to a climax, a destiny. One day, one day Jesus Christ will come back to earth. Advent is coming. It helps us to celebrate that he came and it reminds us that he's coming again and he's coming soon and nothing will ever stop that. Just as God is working in history to move events toward a particular moment, he is working in our lives and our purpose too, but we've got to let him work his purpose in our lives. Connect with God. Find out what his purpose is for you. The Bible says we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God's word doesn't say that everything's good. It doesn't say that God causes everything. God doesn't cause war. God doesn't cause cancer. God doesn't cause rape, child abuse, molestation. God hates evil. People do those things, not God. God gives people the freedom to choose, but evil is the price that some pay into for that freedom. The Bible does say that God causes everything to work together for good. He, he can take the stupid, he can take the evil, he can take the bad decisions you've made in your life and use them for good, but you've got to trust him. Romans 8.28 isn't a promise for everyone. It, it's a promise for those who love God. 
It's for those who trust God. It's for those who are willing to say, look, God, my life is in pieces. It's not fitting together the way I want. Please take the broken pieces of my life and put them all together again. I've gotten to the point where I don't watch the news anymore. My wife watches the news and I watch Westerns. And I do that because I'm tired of it. I, I don't care about the headlines anymore. I, I don't worry. I know there's a lot of problems going on in the world today, but I do know this thing. God, my God, is in control. God is moving. God is going to bring all of this to a resolution. He's bringing it to a climax, and he is moving his people toward that climax, toward what's best for them. God says he's working everything out for his purpose. And because God is in control, I can trust him with everything. And I pray that you can too, including the good, including the bad, including the ugly. Stop feeling like giving up because God is in control. God's love is the answer to your fears. When you know that God will never stop loving you, you can stop being afraid. When you know that God is loving you, you can stop being frustrated. God is in control. God has your best interest in, in mind. He said that he will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible said it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. The only way to get to heaven, the only way to enjoy eternity is to trust God. Trust his son, Jesus Christ. Be led by the Holy Spirit. And today, if you've not made that decision, in the face of all that you are seeing, in the face of all the frustration and fear, there is a remedy. There is a safe place, and it is knowing and being in relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is my fervent hope that if you have not made the decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, that you'll do that today. You have to. You don't have to. You can keep on doing what you're doing. You can keep on thinking that some Democratic Party or some Republican Party or some economic system is going to save you. Yeah, you might get a little bit of relief. You might be a little bit of comfort in finding some other nut to agree with you. But you got eternity to deal with. And that's where life is. And that's where peace is. And that's where joy is. Because our God promises to never leave us or forsake us. So all you have to do is just confess your sin and say, Lord, I messed it up, but I'm ready to give it up. You are in control. Take my life and let it be pleasing to you. And you'll find salvation and we'll help you with that. And if today your life is filled with frustration, you've already come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, reconnect. You unplug. You, you, your battery ain't, it ain't working because you ain't connected to the source. Stop, reconnect, get yourself back in alignment with Jesus Christ. Get yourself back in alignment with God. Let him take control and watch the frustration end. My brothers and sisters, I pray that you will hear the words of Nehemiah, find joy and comfort in knowing that God has not forsaken his people. I pray that you will find comfort in the words of Romans that says that God's people are going to be taken care of. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close our service today with a, mem a memorial to a friend of ours. He's been a friend of the community. His name's Larry Bland. I think most of us are probably familiar with him. Uh, he's passed on to glory, but he's left for us uh, a memorial. And we have the benefit of hearing that today. So if you will, think on our friend and, and appreciate what he has done for us. And then I'll come back with the benediction. If 
if I walk through the pathway of duty and if I work till the close of the day I will know there are joys that will await me oh when I The pathway of duty, and if I work till the close of the day, I will know there are joys that will await me. Amen. And will you receive the benediction? <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May his favor be upon you for a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you. May his presence go before you and behind you and, and beside you and all around you and within you. For God is with you. God is with you. God is with you in the morning. 
He's there with you in the evening. He's there in your coming. He's there in your going. And he's there in your weeping. He's there in your rejoicing. God is for you. God loves you. May his favor be upon you. May his presence go before you. May you realize that he is for you. He is for you. He is for you. Amen. In Jesus' name. Go in peace, my brothers and my sisters. Go in peace.